Well, good morning, Life Center. How we doing? Awesome. Hey, who loves seeing people get baptized? Isn't that so fun? Uh, today, we're continuing our series through the book of Ephesians. Uh, first, I wanted to share a recent family photo with you uh, that my family took. That's our three kids with some pictures sharing that we're expecting. We're pregnant. Well, Sarah's pregnant. Sarah's pregnant, not me. Um, we, uh, we've been talking with the kids about like, we told them on Easter Sunday after we got home from church, we had them open up Easter eggs and they, they, they had a blast. Uh, and we go, Lily, Paxton, Capri, mommy has a baby in her tummy. And Lily gives us this weird look and she's like, mommy, you ate a baby? <laughs> Not quite, Lily Jane. Uh, but then we've been sharing, like, sharing which names we want to name the baby. And I think Lily's name so far is the winner. Uh, she wants to name the baby Watermelon Butterbean Whitwer, which, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, so, hey, that's some uh, recent news I just wanted to share with you guys. Super fun. Uh, to the Bible. Can we move to the Bible? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so today in Ephesians 2, the title of this talk is The Spirit and Enemies, and how we relate with enemies in our lives. And so uh, to, to just get you in the mind of having enemies and what enemies are, uh, I wanted to talk about some famous enemies throughout history. Uh, how many of you know whose enemy, who is Mario's enemy? Bowser, come on, all the little kids are raising their hand. There he is, Mario and Bowser. All right, how about, this is a, this is a little farther back, okay? How about Muhammad Ali? Who is Muhammad Ali's enemy? Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier, come on, right? These guys, the fight of the century. And they went from being friends to being enemies to being friends to being enemies and hating each other throughout their lives. Uh, how about this famous pair, the, the Dazzler Brothers? Do you guys know the Dazzler Brothers? Ooh, can I tell you their story? Okay, so uh, Adolf and Rudolf Dazzler uh, were German brothers who made a shoe company together. And at the 1931 Olympics, don't quote me on that, <laughs> but their shoe was worn by one of the athletes who won a gold medal. Uh, shortly thereafter, Adolf and Rudolf, who'd been in business together for 30 years, uh, had a fracture in their relationship and became enemies. And so instead of together making a shoe company, they created separate shoe companies, Adidas, made by Adi, Adolf, Dazzler, and then Puma, made by Rudolf Dazzler. Have you ever heard of those shoe companies? Uh, so these two brothers made these competing shoe companies. They had factories in the same town. The factory workers bought into the factitious relationship of, that the brothers had so that this town was divided by what shoes you were wearing. And if you were wearing Adidas, then the Puma people looked down on you and hated you. Their resentment lasted throughout their whole lives, so much so that they made sure they were buried on opposite ends of the graveyard in town. Brothers who worked together who became enemies. I tell you that story because I know people in here have had close relationships that have turned into a relationship with an enemy. And my hope for you is that what happened to Adolf and Rudolf doesn't happen to you. My hope and prayer is that you don't take it to the grave, but that you let God deal with it now. And that's what God wants to do. Uh, if I was to say these people are famous enemies, if I said your name and who would you fill in the blank with? If there's someone that you would come to mind right now where you go, yeah, that's, that person, they're my enemy. Uh, and maybe you're like, no, me? I'm a peaceful person. Can I see the hands of all the peaceful people in the room? They're like, I've never had an enemy, you liar. <laughs> Here's what an enemy is. An enemy is someone you are in opposition with. Time and intensity can vary. So what this means is that husband and wife, 
can be in opposition. Husband and wives, have you ever been in opposition before? Do you have a perfect marriage? It means that sometimes you can find yourself in opposition with your kids and you've gone from a father-son relationship to an enemy relationship in that moment. Friends can disagree and find themselves in conflict and find themselves as enemies. Coworkers can be in opposition around ideas and directions. Now, most of us have figured out how to navigate the small conflicts in life so that we go back to unity in our relationships. But what if the time and intensity goes up in your opposition in that relationship? What if someone gossips about you? What if they're publicly hostile to you and they fly off the handle? What if they consistently disrespect you or intentionally hinder your efforts? What if they damage your reputation? And for many of you, you've had someone who's more than that, they've seriously wronged you. They've committed something against you that draws pain in your life even now. We all have enemies at different times. Time and intensity can vary. And so asking this question, what does God want for my relationships with enemies is important. Uh, Well, just to start off, Jesus said, you've heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you to love your enemy. So right off the bat, Jesus tells us to do the exact thing that we don't want to do. Love your enemy, says Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross, he looked on the people who were crucifying him, and he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Friends, Jesus has gone through it. And he loved his enemies and he forgave his enemies. And I believe one of the greatest ways we can be witnesses to Jesus is when we treat our enemies with the same love and forgiveness that Jesus treated his with through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now you may be asking, why should I show love and forgiveness to my enemies? Why should I treat these people in the opposite way of the way they've treated me? Here's why we ought to show love and forgiveness to our enemies is because Jesus did it for us first. I've got two points today. The first is gonna be about our vertical relationship with God, that while we were enemies with Christ, we were reconciled to him. The second is about our horizontal relationship with enemies. So first, to that first point, uh, we're gonna read Romans 5.10. It's gonna be on the screens, and then we're gonna open up to Ephesians 10. But Romans 5.10 summarizes the first 10 verses of Ephesians, 2, uh, of Ephesians 2. Here's what Romans 5.10 says. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Romans 10 says that who is God's enemies? We were. We were God's enemies. And he reconciled us. He made us right with him. So this is point number one. You are reconciled to God in Christ. In Christ Jesus. And when you put your faith in him, your life in his hands, when you're found in him, you are reconciled to God through Jesus. So we're gonna read Ephesians 2, starting at verse one. Would you grab your Bibles and pass them down the rows? It's gonna be found on page 1006. 1006, tell your neighbor 1006 so they don't forget. I know it's hard to remember. (laughs) Ephesians 2, verses one through 10, this is all about how we have been reconciled to God our Father through Jesus Christ. Here we go. As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of 
wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Heavenly Father, we pray that your word would have a powerful effect on our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but the, the more we read Ephesians, the more times I just go, wow. <laughs> it's so rich. It's so beautiful in the way that Paul expresses gospel truths for you and for me. And if we're to break this down into just a few words, this these 10 verses. Here's how I'd break it down. Paul says, you were dead, enslaved, condemned, but God, because of his great love for you, saved you, and now you are seated with Christ, raised with Christ, and saved with him. So here's this. Uh, I want you to, I want to leave this up so we can just work our way through it. Paul says, he says, at, right at the beginning, you were dead. That's very kind of you, Paul. Now, obviously, we are physically alive, but he's talking that we are spiritually dead. Because we were in sins and transgressions, we were walking in the ways of the world. And then he says, you were also following the ways of the spirit of the ruler of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the disobedient. That's a reference to the enemy of our souls, the devil. He said, you were enslaved to the devil's ways. And because of all of this, because you were gratifying your flesh, you were condemned. You were by nature deserving of wrath. That's a pretty bleak look at who we are without Jesus, isn't it? You're dead, you're enslaved, and you're condemned. Nobody wants to sign up for that. And yet that's who we are outside of Christ. Paul paints this incredibly dark picture of our lives without Christ, and I'm so glad that he changes his tune, aren't you? Because all of a sudden he says, but, I love buts, don't you? Don't think that way. I love that interjection to say, no, 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 it's not this anymore. It's not this anymore, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love for you. God wouldn't leave you dead, enslaved, and condemned. Instead, he sent his son Jesus to change the way you exist. The, the Bible says you were God's enemy, that you had wronged him, that you'd gone into rebellion against him. You'd followed your own flesh, You'd sinned, you'd followed his enemy, the, the devil. You'd followed your own desires. And even in the midst of all of your rebellion against God, Jesus, who is rich in love for you, came to save you. I love that interjection of but God. Aren't you grateful that you, even though you were dead, you were condemned, you were enslaved, that God came to your rescue? Is anyone grateful? I'm grateful. And then it says this, now, you who were dead, now you are alive with Christ. You who were enslaved, now you are raised up with Christ. You, were, you who were condemned, now you are saved by grace, created to walk in good works. I love the parallel that Paul does here. At the very beginning, he says, you walked in the ways of the world. And in the Greek, in Ephesians 2.10, it says you were created to walk in good works. 
So he draws this parallel and says, you who once walked in the ways of the world, now you too are, you, you are to walk in the ways of God. And in the middle of that great reversal is the but God statement. You were this, but God, now you are this. <laughs> Friends, this is all of our stories. I was dead, but God made me alive. I was enslaved, but God raised me up with Christ. I was condemned, but God saved me, not by my works, not because of my worth, but because God loves me. That's your story as well. You were this, but when you put your life in Christ, you are made alive with him. I, I wonder what other but God stories you have. Like, like maybe you say, man, in the past, I was addicted, but God came to my rescue. Does anyone have one of those stories, a but God story where you go, hey, I, I was this, but God came and he rescued me, or I was going down the wrong path and God came to get me. There's but God stories are all throughout our life if you look for them. Friends, this, this fact, this gospel that Paul lays out here, it's not just something to believe that you and I are reconciled to God. Yes, we believe it, but now it's a relationship to be experienced. Uh, so when I was at Whitworth University studying theology, I took three years of New Testament Greek. I learned a ton and forgot it all after college. Did anyone else do that? Um, anyway, so in my third year of Greek, I wrote a paper on this passage, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And I poured my life into that paper. I mean, I studied so hard. I tried to pull apart every verb. I tried to look at everything. And I felt when I turned this like 25 page paper in, I was like, this is the culmination of my learning, my theological training here at Whitworth University. I was so proud of it. Mm -hmm. I got it back and my professor said, hey, it was well written. I can tell you put a lot of time into it, but you missed one glaringly obvious thing. He said, you pulled apart all of these words, but you missed a phrase that is repeated most often in the passage. He said, here's what you missed. You missed the phrase, with Christ. You pulled apart the grace and the, the salvation and that you were dead and enslaved. You pulled all that apart, but you missed with Christ. Friends, here's what I want you to catch. It's so easy for us in our lives to believe the right things, to parse different situations in our life and try to figure out what God wants. But what we miss so often is being with Christ. And do you know what God wants most for you? Why did he reconcile you? Why did he come to your rescue? So that you could be with Christ. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy for our love to be diverted. But I want to tell you this, the reason God came to change your situation is not just so you could get a free ticket to heaven, but so that you could know him now. So that you could experience him now. You could be in real, authentic relationship with Jesus now. What's most important in your life is a real relationship with Christ. Have you, like me, missed the main point at some times? Getting distracted by all sorts of other things that may be good, that may be important, but are not the most important. Let's be the sort of people who prioritize our vertical relationship with God, because when we do, when we make this the most important thing, our relationship with God, it's gonna bless our horizontal relationships. And that's what we're turning to next. Point number two is this. You, first, you've been reconciled to God in Christ. Now you are reconciled to enemies in Christ. Uh, you know, if we're honest, most of us do not want to be reconciled to our enemies. Most of us, what we would like to do if there was a bridge between our enemy 
and us, we would like to pour some gas on it, light a match, toss it, and walk away. Wouldn't we? We would just like to distance ourselves as much from our enemies as possible. We would like to have nothing to do with them. So I just wanna pause and say, if you have someone in your mind who's caused great pain to you, who has deeply divided your family, who has caused great harm to your reputation or to those you love, if you are hurting because of that, I want you to know Jesus sees you. If you feel harassed or attacked by people, I want you to know Jesus sees you. If you feel betrayed, Jesus sees you. If you just feel wronged at the deepest level of your soul, Jesus sees you. Friends, Jesus was hurt by his disciples with their lack of faith. Jesus was harassed by the Jewish leaders, the people who he'd come to partner with. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He was wronged when his disciples abandoned him. I want to say Jesus sees you. He understands the pain that enemies cause. And Jesus loves you. He wants the best for you. And his good plans don't include the weight of pain and anger that you feel toward your enemies. God does not intend for your enemies to have greater influence in your life than he does. And yet for many of us, our enemies have determined the direction of our lives more than God has. What they've done to us, our anger towards them, our hostility towards them has caused us to divert from the path of Jesus. God does not intend, he loves you so much that he does not intend your enemies to have greater influence in your life than he does. So to pull apart this, uh, this idea, we're gonna look at the rest of Ephesians 2, uh, but to give you some context first, Paul's gonna talk about how Jew and Gentile were reconciled to each other in Christ. Now Jew and Gentile uh, is not just a racial divide, this was a religious divide, it was a social divide. It was a moral division. And so Jew and Gentile hated each other more than we understand. These were the greatest of enemies in Jesus' day, Jew and Gentile. And to understand their enmity, I wanna give you a quote from William Barclay. Here's what William says. He says, the Jew had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles, said the Jews, were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. The barrier between them was absolute. So much so that if a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out then and there. Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. Jew and Gentile were mortal enemies. They hated each other with a contempt that ran deep in their blood. And now Paul in Ephesians 2 is going to address how in Christ, these two enemies, whose division was absolute, they have been made one in Christ. Here's what Paul says, Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, he's speaking to Gentile Christians at this moment. He says, therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of, promise, of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. 
He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So what did Jesus do for the Jews and the Gentiles? To, to shortly put it together, he, he made the two, these two people who were divided greatly, he made them one new humanity in himself. He put one spirit, the Holy Spirit, in these people. He called them citizens of his kingdom, members of his family, blocks built together in his temple. He made peace by tearing down the dividing wall of hostility. This is an important phrase. So I made a wall to help describe it. Now, here, here's, here's what I want you to know. The dividing wall of hostility here, referenced in Ephesians 2, is probably a reference to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In the Jewish temple, there were many courts uh, where the farther you went in, here you can see a picture, the farther you went in, the closer you got to God's presence. And so this outer court, the huge wall around it, contains uh, the inner temple complex, but that outer court that you see people milling around in that's the court of the Gentiles. This is the court where Gentiles could come and show up in the temple. But the inner wall, the, the light stone that you see there with all the arrows pointing into it, that big inner wall was a dividing wall that kept Gentiles out. And, and they had notices on that wall that said this, Gentile, beware. If you enter here, you have only yourself to blame for your death. If you wanna get closer to God, you can't because you're a Gentile. And if you try to get closer, if you try to enter through these doors, we will kill you. There's some hostility there, isn't there? That is a dividing wall of hostility. And so Paul is referencing what the Gentiles experienced, the hostility that they experienced from the Jews. And he said, you used to experience this dividing wall where you couldn't get closer to God, the Jews wouldn't let you. But he says, in Christ, that dividing wall is taken down. You can now get to as close to God as you want to. Christ has taken down the hostility between Jew and Gentile. He's made you one. So he says, even though Jew and Gentile, you may feel hostility towards each other in Christ, <laughs> In his kingdom, in his family, in his temple, no dividing walls are allowed. So to the greatest of enemies, Paul says, Christ paid for all of the wrongs. You can stop fighting, no walls allowed. Now to you, to you and I, who have been wronged by others, he said, Christ has paid for the wrongs. Stop hating. Stop holding on to bitterness. Start moving towards forgiveness. There are no dividing walls allowed in Christ. And right now you may be thinking, hey, time out. You have no idea what my enemies have done to me. You have no idea the wrongs they've perpetrated and you're right. I don't understand what they've done to you. But I do know what God has done for you. He loves you, he forgave you when you were dead, when you were his enemy, he came and rescued you and made you alive with Christ. I know that God desperately wants you to stop living with hostility, anger, hurt, pain, bitterness, and unforgiveness <laughs> in your heart. And maybe you're thinking like, hey, I, I, that's in the past, I don't have a dividing wall of hostility anymore, I, I'm letting it go, and if that's true, awesome. But I think for most of us, there are some walls in our hearts that God wants to bring down. 
There's some dividing walls that keep us far from people that he says, hey, I, I, I don't want you to carry that weight anymore. So let me help you understand if you have a wall in your life. If you're experiencing anger in your life, that might be a sign that you have a wall. If you're experiencing unforgiveness, where you just say, I cannot forgive that person, I will not forgive that person, that's a wall in your life, a weight that God wants to bring down, a prison that's keeping you in one place and God wants to free you from it. Maybe you say, hey, I've forgiven them, but I still have ill will towards them. I get it. But God doesn't want that for you. Maybe you say, hey, I've tried and I've tried to forgive, but the offense keeps running through my mind. That might be a sign that you still have a wall in your life that God wants to bring down. Maybe you'd say, hey, I, I've tried and I've tried, but I just have this bitterness in my soul. I don't want any part with those people. I don't want good for them. I, I just don't know what to do. That might be a sign that you have a wall in your life that Christ wants to bring down. If there's avoidance in your life, like I just don't go near those people. Now listen, I understand that you need healthy boundaries in your life, amen? You need healthy boundaries. But for some of us, we're just avoiding people even though we shouldn't. We need to move toward the other, not away from them. Finally, maybe you have apathy in your life and you'd say, hey, I just really don't care about that person anymore. I don't give two hoots what they do, who they are, don't want them in my life. It might be a sign that you've still got a wall in your heart, even though you've distanced yourselves from them. Maybe you consistently feel rejection in your life. And what the person has done to you has caused this sense of rejection that's caused self-doubt. That might be a sign that you still have a wall in your life. You're allowing your enemy and what they've done to have greater influence in your life than what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. And if you have any one of these in your heart, there might still be a wall in your life. Have you guys ever seen uh, one of those remodel shows like Chip and Joanna Gaines or any, any show like that? They walk into a house and they're like, oh, this is nice, this is nice. But that wall, it's gotta go. Right, like every time they're tearing down walls. Friends, when you're in Christ, Christ lives in you. His Holy Spirit has been deposited in you. And the Holy Spirit, when he moves into your heart, I believe he wants to renovate your heart. And that when he comes in, one of the first things he might do is say, we need to take out some walls. I think God loves an open concept heart. He's very modern like that. <laughs> but maybe you need help taking out a wall in your life. Maybe you'd go, yeah, I do have a wall. I need help laying it down. And friends, that's what Jesus loves to do. I'm gonna have some friends come and help me lay down this wall. Uh, there's four of them, so that doesn't really work out to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we could pretend, right? Um, God wants to lay this down. He, he doesn't want this in your life anymore. He wants to take the anger, the unforgiveness, the ill will, the rejection, the apathy. He wants that out of your life. He, he wants to free you from it so that you no longer are bound by a wall, but released to live in his goodness, his grace, his love, his care, so that you could be alive with Christ instead of weighed down by what your enemy has done in your life. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life. And the good news is, in Christ, he's already done it. And so all you need to do is invite him in to make real what he did on the cross, to affect the change that he paid for on the cross. And if you've done this, if you've laid down a wall in your life, if you've forgiven someone, you know how good it feels, don't you? To be freed from that, it's amazing. And that's what Christ wants for you. Here's the problem. Christ can do that for us, but people will still wrong us. 
Christ can lay down a wall in your life and take out the unforgiveness in your life, and then someone's going to come along and they're gonna give you all the material you need, you need to build a wall in the place of the one that Christ laid down. And so I'm gonna have the guys come in and here's what happens. Someone offends us and we go, all right, bring it in. Come on, we're putting the wall back up. This is not good, we need a wall. Come on, come on, right here, right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have anger in my life to protect me. I'm gonna have bitterness to remove me from them. I'm gonna create that apathy because I don't want anything to do with them. And we put up a wall. Whoa, careful guys. We put up a wall in the place of one that Christ just took down. This happens in our life all the time. People will give you all the material you need. They're wonderful at providing all of that. The gossip, the hurt, the offense, they'll provide all you need to make a wall. And so what so often happens is as Christians, we build walls in the place of the ones that Christ has taken down. Whether it's racism, nationalism, tribalism, our political divides, personal animosities engendered by our pride, by our prejudice, by our jealousy of others, or just an unforgiving spirit in here. I want you to imagine uh, that you buy a house and uh, you're excited, you love this house, and you move in, and uh, like a month later, the people you bought the house from they all of a sudden show up in your house. How many of you are like, mm-mm, get out. Thank you for the house, but it's not yours anymore. Now imagine they show up in your house and they start building a wall in your living room. And they're like, oh, we just thought it would be better if we left you with this wall. What would you do? Call the police. Thank you so much. Every single one of us, that would be the first... Excuse me, officer, yep, I need you to come take this person out. Friends, our lives are not our own. Our lives are not our own. They've been bought by the blood of Jesus. When we invite him in, we invite him to make this heart his home. And then here's what we do. We say, God, have your way, tear down the walls. He tears down the walls. And then we try to sneak back into the house and say, but Jesus, I'm building a wall right here because of that person, because of what they did to me, because I'm trying to protect myself. And we build walls in the house of God where he desires to live and move freely, not restricted by our anger or our jealousy or our unforgiveness. We're doing the same thing to God that that illustration says. We're moving back in and trying to build walls where God doesn't want them. Here's why God wants to take out the walls in your life. I'm almost done. Here's why God wants to take out the walls in your life. First, because your enmity in one relationship will limit your intimacy in all relationships. Your enmity in one relationship will inhibit your intimacy in all relationships. Have you ever been in a relationship with someone and then you get to a discussion and all of a sudden they sort of flare up or they get triggered, what's happening is you've hit a wall in their life and you aren't allowed to go past that wall because they want it there for protection. And so what's happening is your intimacy with that person is limited by their enmity with another. And you and I, we will limit our relationships. We will limit the beauty and the richness of our relationships if we allow walls of hostility to remain in our hearts. Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Do we take that seriously? God, forgive me as I forgive. Would you allow me that intimacy with you that I've allowed with others by forgiving? Uh, here's another reason that God wants to take out the walls in your life. Uh, you were never mar- made to carry the weight of those walls. We think that, uh, you know, like there's a wall here and yeah, great, I'll, I'll just step over here for a moment. But what happens, friends? You have to take this wall with you. You, you have to carry your unforgiveness. 
and your bitterness. No one's gonna carry it for you. You hold on to it. And because of that, there are many people who are moving through life like this. Hey, one sec, I'll be right there. I just gotta take care of my unforgiveness and my hatred right here. Friends, this was an, a weight you were never made to hold. You weren't made to carry unforgiveness and hatred. The human heart is not strong enough for that. The other reason God wants to take the walls out of your life is if you try to leave them, if you try to let go of them without Christ's help, you're gonna bounce back. It's a little bit like, oh, hey, there it is. It's over here. You ever seen one of these? It's a bungee cord. And I think this is what we do. We're like, oh, I could just, I could just move. I could just not deal with this and move away from it. You can't. You are tethered to your walls in life. You're tethered to your unforgiveness, your anger, your bitterness, your ill will. And so if you want to be free from this, the only way is with Christ's help. The only way is with the power of the Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit, would you take out the walls in my life? Don't let me be bound to my anger, unforgiveness, or the pain that my enemies have caused. Would you set me free, God, from the hurt that they've caused in my life? And he desperately wants to. So here's everything I need to hear. I'll give them to you in a short blast. You can't control your enemies, but you can forgive them. You're never gonna get them to apologize on their hands and knees like you want them to, but you can let go in your heart and be freed from the offense that you carry with the Holy Spirit's help. The next thing is you cannot afford the energy enmity requires. We all have limited energy. We all have limited focus. We all have limited attention and affection. And the more that you pour into opposition with the enemy, the less you have to give to God. Friends, I don't know about you, but the amount of energy that I have to pour into God, it's not enough. I want more. And so if you want more energy for God, let go of the energy you're investing into opposition with enemies. The next thing that I need to hear is this, when triggered by the past, bring your honest emotions into God's presence. Are you angry? You can bring it to God. You don't have to mask it. You don't have to try to deal with it outside of his presence and then come into his presence sparkly. Friends, while you were his enemy, God reconciled you. While you were dead, he reconciled you. He made you alive. He knows you in every intimate detail. And if you would just be honest with your anger or with whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're carrying, that's when he can actually help you. But when you hide it behind your back, God's only gonna deal with what you hold out to him. Finally, cling to Jesus, not your walls. So often we put up and leave up walls for protection, uh, but the walls that we trust to be our protection actually become our prison. The more walls that you have in life, the more boxed in you are in life. And so don't cling to your walls for protection, cling to Jesus. Here's what Psalm 18:2 says of our God. The Lord is my rock my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Uh, several months ago, as a staff, we were doing a prayer exercise and we did this little thing where it was, it was silly, but we took these two Lego pieces and the prompt said, hey, pray about who God wants you to be reconciled with. And then when you have that person in your mind, put the Legos together and ask God to help you reconcile with that person. And immediately someone popped into my mind and I was like, Jesus, there's no way I'm putting these Legos together. I did not want any part of it. I said, hey God, this is a cute exercise, but it's not for me. I do not want to be reconciled. I don't want to go near. I'm too hurt. I'm in too much pain. I, I don't want a part of it. And as I was arguing with God about this, as I was talking to him and saying, God, this really, how, how do you expect me to do this? He told me to do something. He said, Michael, 
put the Legos together. I was like, mm-mm. He's like, put the Legos together. I was like, nope. Put the Legos together. So in obedience, I put them together. And here's what I heard him say. He said, Michael, what matters most is that you connect with me. He said, I understand you're afraid of connecting with that person. I understand the pain that they've caused. I understand all that, but if you connect with me, I'll be enough to sustain you. If you're truly connected with me, then I'll get you through those interactions. If you are connected with me, I will be your rock, your fortress, your protection. So would you connect with me? I said, yeah, I can do that. I'll trust you. I'll connect with you and trust you to help me bring down the walls, to carry me through those interactions. God, I trust you enough to do that. I'm gonna invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. Just in this moment of prayer, I wonder if there are people in this room who need God to take out a wall in their lives. There's hostility, anger, unforgiveness, and you need God to remodel your heart. You may be even saying like, hey, I don't wanna connect with that person. Would you just connect with God? and let him do the work. So right now, friend, if that's you, if, if you need God's help to take out a wall in your life, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you and see that, man, there's a wall in your life that you need God to do a work on. Yeah, I see hands all over the room. Heavenly Father, for every hand raised, I pray that you would renovate heart, that you, God, would do a work that only you can do. Release them from bitterness. God, we pray against the power of unforgiveness that you would break it in Jesus' name, that any anger that's been weighing them down, they would be released from right now. Heavenly Father, greater is you, greater are you who's in them than he who's in the world. The enemy cannot hold a candle to you, God, and so we trust you to do a greater work in us than the enemy has been trying to do around us. Father, thank you for tearing down walls, would you help us to walk in the freedom that you desire? Finally, I just want to take a moment. If you've never said yes to connecting with God, you've never trusted him to take you from a spiritually dead state to a spiritually alive state, if you want to make that decision to have a real relationship with Jesus through what he's done for you on the cross by trusting your life into his hands. I, I wanna pray for you if you wanna make that decision. If you wanna make that decision, would you just, again, while everyone else's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you look up at me and say, I, I wanna follow Jesus. Look up at me, raise your hand so I can identify you're making that decision to follow Jesus for the first time. I see you right there. Thank you so much. I see you back there. Thank you so much for saying yes to Jesus. That's amazing. Best decision of your life. I see you over there. Thank you for saying yes to Jesus. Best decision of your life. Heavenly Father, thank you. Yep, you back there. I see you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for every person who just was made alive in you, born again into a new family. God, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit and help them to walk with you in real relationship. God, would we be the sort of church that's a family to those who need you? Help us, God, to love others well, to set down what you've never made us to carry, and instead to receive all of your love, your joy, your peace, your kindness, your grace, your mercy that you want to pour into our lives. Right now, God, we receive who you are and what you want for us. Would you help us? Fill us with your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Friends,